thankful that we have a time during the week where we can come and pray together. And uh, I think uh, a praying church is a healthy church. And so thank you for coming to prayer meeting tonight. And uh, as we uh, go before the throne of grace and uh, just uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, if you have not received a prayer guide, would you please slip your hand up and our gentleman will come around and serve you with one of those. Brother Ross has them back there. And just slip your hand up and uh, he'll make sure you get one. I just want to remind you of a verse out of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And, uh, the Bible says that we ought to give thanks in everything, right? And boy, there is lots to be thankful for. And I know there are trials and I know there are valleys, but praise the Lord, there's always things that we can point to and say, God did that and God provided that. And uh, for that, we're thankful. And so uh, let's bring our request to him tonight. Uh, on that prayer guide, uh, if you are new with us, there is a portion that is perforated. You can fill out that prayer request form and place it in the offering plate as it's passed by you in just a few minutes. In fact, uh, fellas, let's just go ahead and take up, uh, receive our offering tonight, please. And we'll ask God's blessing on it. Would you bow in prayer with me as we ask God's blessing on this offering? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for who we get to serve. We are thankful for you and the God that you are. Lord, I am so thankful for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of people. And Lord, I pray that you'll continue to work in a mighty way. Lord, as we approach... Resurrection Sunday and the celebration that we serve a risen Savior. Uh, God, I pray that you will stay the devil. He would like nothing more to, than to discourage us. But Lord, we know the greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so I pray that you'll put your hand on this offering. Bless it, please. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. All right, just want to remind you of some of the things that we just pray about weekly. And that is, please pray for our Sunday gatherings and expect God to do great things in them. And uh, praise the Lord for the things that even took place on Sunday. Uh, I, I'm, if you aren't able to come on Sunday mornings, I'm preaching through the book of Lamentations, which is just a fun book to preach to through, I'm telling you. And because uh, the whole thing has to do with sin. And so uh, preaching through that, but uh, there was a, a lady that was actually listening to our broadcast on the phone while she was driving and drove past our property and came up and came into our foyer and told the security person out there, I need to hear this message, and came and uh, went to the altar during the invitation. And uh, so, by the way, only God can do something like that. Okay, we can't work that kind of stuff up, even if we wanted to. Okay, uh, so I'm thankful for what the Lord is doing and uh, praising the Lord for it. But uh, He wants to do greater things than these, and uh, we're embarking on a very high uh, evangelistic Sunday. Uh, Easter Sunday is a very high evangelistic day. We'll have many guests here, and the devil hates that. And so I can always tell when a high evangelistic day is approaching because the devil ramps it up just a little bit uh, and uh, the uh, uh, prince and power of the air works overtime uh, sometimes. But uh, we're praying that God does a great work on Easter Sunday and I hope that you'll be inviting people to come and attend. If you have your prayer guide this evening, notice just a few things. Our missionaries, first of all, uh, are listed there. Kevin Byers to Oregon. And then Brother Jason Caldwell with Seeing Truth Ministries is listed there as well. And we are just praising the Lord for the reports 
from, from Seeing Truth Ministries even over this past weekend. If you weren't in the weekend meetings, uh, Brother Jason had about 64 people make a profession of faith this past weekend. And uh, man, we are just so grateful that the Lord worked in those meetings. And uh, we just have to be careful what we eat at those meetings, right? Because people might get sick from eating raccoon. And uh, so uh, uh, anyway, and then our nursing home ministries just are so thankful for what the Lord is doing in our nursing home ministries and uh, the glory that is being shown to the Lord through them. And then we do have health concerns here. Uh, would you please uh, keep uh, Brother Howard Caldwell in your prayers? Um, Brother Caldwell uh, has has really good days and then he has really bad days and uh, t yesterday was was a really bad day today was a better day uh, but uh, we are just praying God's healing touch on him uh, on this road to his next surgery and uh, a long recovery time for this next surgery and so would you please pray for him as he goes through that and would you specifically pray um, somebody remind me is it his right eye or his left eye does anybody know it's not, not that it matters the Lord knows his right eye um, that it would that it would heal because right now brother Caldwell can't do one of the things that he loves to do very well and that is read and write and so would you please pray that that eye would heal uh, very quickly and uh, then uh, would you please pray uh, in bereavement? Would you please pray uh, for the Jenkins family? Nancy Jenkins' mom passed away. And so we are praying uh, fervently for that family. And then would you also please pray for Jason McKenzie, who is in open heart surgery right now and has been since about 1.45 this afternoon. Surgery is expected to last until about 9 or 10 tonight. And uh, we are just praying God's touch. He is the great physician. He is a greater physician than anybody that's working on Jason right now. And uh, we're just praying that uh, the Lord would heal that heart and that the heart would be strong enough to accept everything that they're doing. Uh, the fact that they're going in um, is, is a better scenario in, in the fact that they're able to fix more while they're in there. And so would you please pray that all of that just comes to pass. And of course, please pray for Angie and Malia as well and uh, then uh, would you please pray uh, for uh, the Longs and uh, the DeHavens they've got a wedding coming up here and uh, the uh, Kelsey uh, I got uh, pictures today of the pod being dropped off at her house and she's loading everything up and so would you just keep everybody in prayer there especially as they travel lots of people traveling for that um, then I have some that have been submitted here tonight. Oh, would you also please keep Tracy Brown in your prayers as well for recovery? Uh, she, uh, of course, has very bad back pain and then uh, uh, healing from some falls she's taken. And we're just praying for her. And then would you pray for Maggie? I don't know if she's... Oh, she's down in sign language. Maggie had uh, Invisalign put on today. And so her mouth is sore, but not as sore as if she had braces put on. And so uh, she's just getting used to those. And so would you please pray for her? Uh, here's some that have been submitted here th this evening. Would you please pray for Eric Rank? This is Brother Zach's dad. Uh, testing in a couple weeks. That includes a biopsy. Uh, would you please pray for Eric Rank, please? And then... Uh, would you please pray for Mabel Snyder? Uh, she's got a, a head cold, very scratchy throat, and we're praying for Miss Mabel. Uh, would you please pray for uh, Glenn Marple having dental work done on Tuesday? And then would you please pray for Donna Marple's son, Jared, and family, uh, and uh, a fire in Wardensville, West Virginia, also Baker, West Virginia, and Moorfield, West Virginia. And uh, I know that there were reports today of even up on the mountain over here, some, some fires uh, as well. So please keep all of those situations in your uh, uh, prayers. Also pray for Miss uh, Tracy Brown uh, having two teeth pulled on Friday and that that would all go well because there'll be some difficulty eating after that is done. Uh, would you please pray for Teresa 
Grinewalt. Uh, this is Lori Feaster's cousin uh, having heart valve surgery next week. And then would you please pray for Jeff McDonald. This is the Feaster's neighbor knee replacement on Friday. And uh, we'll keep all of these things in our prayers. And then if you would, uh, please keep those that are on our list here that need to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior and that they would come to a saving knowledge of Him. And uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. You can find somebody to pray with. You're more than welcome to pray by yourself. Uh, you're more than welcome to utilize the altar area as well as we go to prayer. But I'll close us here in just a few minutes. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we get to come to you and are invited to come to you on the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. Lord, I pray that you'll guide us tonight in our gospel stations. I pray that you'll guide us in our Bible study tonight. Lord, I'm so thankful for the folks that were able to come out. I pray that you'll just bless them for, for doing that and putting the effort forth. Uh, Lord, I know some of them are very tired just coming from work perhaps and uh, God I pray that you'll strengthen them give them something they can use in this Bible fellowship tonight uh, Lord I pray that you will guide 
doctor's hands even now as Brother Jason McKenzie's in surgery. Uh, Lord, I pray for Tracy Brown tonight that you'll heal her. And Lord, I pray that you will guide the dentist as they do teeth work on Friday. Uh, Lord, I pray for, uh, Lord, those that are going through deep water tonight and trials tonight and that you will pour a very special uh, portion of grace on them tonight, please. Pray that you'll show your strong hand to them. And Lord, we are so grateful for this church and what it stands for. Lord, we are so grateful to be able to point people to you. Guide us tonight, please, so that your honor and your glory will be our priority. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, uh, if you have a gospel station, I invite you to uh, be a part of that. Uh, if you get done early in your gospel station, I'd encourage you to come back in the room uh, here in the main auditorium. Uh, we just uh, don't want any downtime, okay? Uh, want to keep things gospel-centered and great commission-centered, and I appreciate your help in that. For those of you that uh, are staying in the Bible study, I invite you to take God's Word and go to Jude 3. This is where we've been starting every week. Jude and the third verse. And this will be our final week talking about uh, the Latter-day Saints. And so we've got a lot to cover in the next 42 minutes or so. Uh, I've got uh, two video excerpts for you to see tonight that I think will be very helpful. But Jude 3... This is where we've started every week. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We have one gospel, right? Has that gospel changed in 2,000 years? No. In fact, the gospel hasn't changed since creation. The gospel is the same. And so it says, Jude says, it was once delivered unto the saints. That means it was delivered one time, right? Uh, there is no new gospel. There's nothing being added to that. The gospel is simply the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our goal to help people understand their need of Christ. That includes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, over in Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 uh, very familiar verses to you it's our great commission verse right and, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you and lo I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Uh, if you go back to verse 19 and look at that verse, that is really the verse we tend to use the most for the Great Commission, although I believe the Great Commission is 18, 19, and 20. You can't separate those. Uh, they're not, uh, there's not one verse here uh, for the Great Commission. There are three. But this one, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations as long as they don't believe a false religion. Okay? So this is what I'm trying to get across to you. This is why I'm doing this, that when we are approached by people who believe something so outrageous or so out there, we have just as much a responsibility to point them to Jesus Christ as anyone else. And so when, when the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, when their missionaries come uh, to your porch, my goal in this is for us to check our demeanor and for us to check our motive. Okay? And the video expert, eh, experts, I keep saying experts and it's excerpts. Uh, the video excerpts tonight are going to help us with that. We're going to see two. Well, the first one we're going to see is going to help us explain, going to explain to us a little further about the ordinances of the Mormon church. Now, we have ordinances as well. 
Does anybody know how many we have? We have two, right? And they are the Lord's Supper and baptism. That's it. Those are the ordinances of the church. And uh, so that's what we are familiar with whenever we think of the ordinances. You're going to hear some things tonight that are totally outrageous to you as a believer, or at least I hope they are. Uh, you have to understand something. Let me do it this way. How many of you, as sure as you're sitting there, you know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him? As sure as you're sitting here tonight, you know that's true. Okay. As strongly as you feel about that is as strong as these Mormon missionaries feel about what they're telling you. You are the apostate. You are the one who needs to know the truth. So this afternoon, some of our teenagers were out knocking on doors, passing out gospel literature. Why? Well, because we want people to hear the truth. We're passionate about that. Well, they are just as passionate, if not more so. In fact, we could take a couple notes from the zeal and the passion of a Mormon missionary. Now, the problem is they got the wrong motive, right? And they're going to say things like they want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that something you might say to somebody if you were witnessing? Yes, absolutely. They're going to say things like uh, we would like to have a Bible study with you and show you more out of the Bible. Uh, that's something we would say if we were talking to somebody. The only problem is they mean something totally different than what we mean when we say those things. And so I hope that, that you understand after tonight, our goal in this is not to win an argument. Our goal in this is not to make somebody think that we are theologically superior in some way. No, we're going to learn about these ordinances and then the last video we're going to see tonight, and I'll say a few things in between just to recap, but the last video we're going to see tonight is how to witness to a Mormon. So when you are in contact with a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my, my goal for you is to not be fearful or, you know, shut all the lights out in the house and dive behind furniture and hope nobody knows you're home. My goal would be for a Lighthouse Baptist Church member to open the door and say, how are you? Would you like to come in and talk about this? Now, that is unheard of. That is unheard of. I don't want it to be unheard of. Do, do Mormons live in our community? Then there should be converted Mormons in our church. Okay. Uh, just like there should be different ethnicities in our church, there should be converted Mormons in our church. Uh, are we hearing from a converted Mormon in, in, our, in these videos? Yes. So that's possible. We know that that's possible. This young man that is talking here uh, was confronted by a Baptist preacher who spoke love into his life and compassion into his life and didn't shoo him off or make him feel like a second-rate person and just spoke truth into his life. So we're, we're going to hear from, from, from this young man again. But I think the most important, or one of the most important aspects of the Great Commission is the power in which we do it. Can you witness to somebody in the wrong spirit? <laughs> yes, absolutely you can. Uh, so that's not the power that we want whenever we are contending for the faith. We want to be driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We must go in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way fruitful work can be done. Is every conversation with a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is every conversation going to come out like we want it to come out? No, it most certainly is not. Because they are just as passionate about what they're doing 
as what you as what as as passionate about what you're saying. So I, I want us to have an open mind as we as we move forward here. But I want you to hear about these ordinances because this is the crux of what a Mormon missionary is not going to tell you whenever they're witnessing to you on the porch. Okay? But this is common practice in the Mormon church, and I want you to be aware of it so you can be better equipped when talking to them. So, Miss Jane, let's show that first one there. The, you've mentioned the ordinances several times. Mm -hmm. Could you quickly define for me the what are the ordinances you're doing? So you've helped a great deal define the books and the literature. Mm -hmm. You said going to the temple mm -hmm. and going through the ordinances. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining the way you describe it, stations or certain mm -hmm. practices or certain rituals. Could you take me there for a minute and kind of... What are the ordinances? Because I'm coming from a Christian context of, okay, the ordinances for me are <laughs> baptism and communion. Right, right. And I do those on Sunday or observe those. Yeah. For you guys, what are, what's happening at the temple? Yeah, so there's kind of two primary things that happen in the temple. Number one is they do vicarious work for the dead. Okay, okay. meaning that they believe certain ordinances to be saving ordinances. One of them is water baptism, baptism by immersion. Another one is like receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Okay, so those things, like if a person dies and they don't have those things done, a Mormon can do them on their behalf oh, yeah. in the temple. So literally, you can physically go and be baptized in water for the, for dead. the dead, for a dead person. So those are part of the ordinances. Um, so the first ordinance of Mormonism is baptism by immersion. Immersion. Um, the second one would be the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Um, and then the, the pinnacle of ordinances is called the endowment ceremony. And this is something that's extremely sacred to Mormons and they don't talk about outside the temple. So without like giving too many details that would be deliberately offensive, it's essentially like it's kind of Masonic in nature. And so there's like certain signs, there's certain like robes of the priesthood um, and certain hand signals and other things that they do within this. It's a ceremony, basically. So yeah, like even stations and things like that. You do it multiple times or you do it so once? So you do it once for yourself and that's kind of a big moment for you. And once you do that for yourself, every time you do it, it is then on behalf of somebody else, of a dead person. It's a vicarious work. A devout Mormon and a very zealous one is potentially going back to the temple frequently thousands of times and and thinking of people they love and their their loved ones maybe a, a friend who died or yeah. and so you're technically there's no end to it well yeah and it's not like it's a very official process so like you actually have a card yep. with somebody's name on it that has their birth date, where they were born, their death date, where they died, I mean, all that stuff, and it's an official process. So it's not just me going through and thinking about no, somebody, it's literally very like... intentional. Yeah, it's a very intentional process, and so you're going through and you're doing it on behalf of somebody, and you're thinking about, you know, their salvation and other things. So yeah, so it's, those parts of the Mormon lifestyle are very sacred to them, and they were to me as well. And so I would go through, and I, as a Mormon temple worker, I was helping other people perform the ordinances. So for example, uh, I I would be in the baptismal font and I would be the person baptizing other people as they, you know, were doing ordinances on behalf of other people. Um, the other kind of primary ordinance in Mormonism is actually marriage. So in the Mormon temple, people are married. That's where their ordinance of marriage happens, but it's unique and it's different than a traditional Christian marriage in that they are sealed. And what that means is that their marriage does not end when they die. It's a sealing for eternity. So they actually believe that they are married and they use the frame for all time or the phrase for all time and eternity. And another question on that, just again for me to know, the I know some people will say, well Mormons and polygamy is kind of a thing mm -hmm. or not, and we can get into some of that if you want to enlighten us, but the is that also can you be married to multiple people in eternity or is your eternal marriage to one person? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Um, traditional polygamy Right, a man having more than one wife at the same time in the flesh has been outlawed for Mormonism for 120 years. Okay. However, if you're married to somebody and you're sealed to them in the temple, 
and you remarry, if they die, you can be sealed to more than one spouse at a time. In eternity, then. Therefore, in eternity, technically, you can have more than one spouse. A man can, not a woman. Got it. Uh, you can't live polyamory, but you can live polygamy, which means a man having more than one wife. So, okay. yeah, it's very interesting. One other question on that, because <laughs> I love how much you know all this so well, is singleness, because mm -hmm. if marriage is an ordinance, is singleness looked down upon, or is it considered, because I would assume you guys, did you read Paul, the apostle, would you read the New Testament epistles as part of some of your Mormonism, and when Paul says stuff about singleness and being zealous and a missionary almost as a single person and not having right. to worry too much about marriage in 1 Corinthians 7 in right. the Bible, did you look down on unmarried folks who were adults and single because an ordinance that you would want to go through is marriage? Uh, yeah, yeah, because basically to achieve like the highest level of heaven, right, and, and the greatest form of, of exaltation, of, of salvation that God had to offer, marriage was part of that. Like you need to be married to get there. And this goes, and that, you know, this is kind of a tangent doctrinally here, but, um, and that's because Mormonism teaches that God himself is married, that there is a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. Okay, so that is a, that's an eternal part of who God is, and like that nature of who we are and can eternally be is, is part of that relationship. And who's mother God? Like right now, it, do you guys have a, you had a trinity, no? Or... Kind of, they call it the Godhead. So the it's Godhead. Heavenly Father, Jesus the Son, and then the Holy the Spirit. The Holy Ghost yeah. or the Holy Spirit. Right. And where is Mother God in that? So basically, they don't really talk about Heavenly Mother. And the reason why, at least what was explained to me, is because it's too sacred. Like, like God loves his wife so much, he doesn't want her name to be defiled like his name has been defiled. And you'll get to know her more on the other side. Sure, maybe. yeah. So you don't like pray to Heavenly Mother. You don't have any relationship or understanding of who, who she is other than, you know, she is the counterpart to Heavenly Father. So yeah, so, so marriage is a considerably important thing in Mormon doctrine and even in their theology because if you're not married, like you can't achieve the highest level of heaven. And so actually another thing they do in the temple is vicarious marriages. They will actually marry people that are married or were married in, in, in life or sometimes people that aren't. They'll just take random people and, and, and you know, can marry them in order to give them a spouse so that they can, you know, achieve exaltation. So, yeah, so like very rarely, I mean, I, you would never hear a Mormon leader or anybody encourage a person to pursue singleness. And even like in the Christian church, I think it's, that's a topic that we're very ignorant about. Um, First Corinthians 7, like Paul very clearly says, like, if you you can remain single, like you can actually serve God in a greater capacity. I mean, that's basically kind of the summation of what he says. And, and I understand that, you know, as, as a father and as somebody who's been married, it's like, yeah, I mean, I understand that there are worldly distractions to those things, but yet God uses us in our glory, in his glory to, to you know, bring forth the gospel to people in whatever state that we're in. Um, I know I have a dear sister in Christ who's 26 years old who has come forward to our ministry and said, I feel the call to singleness. That's unusual, even in the Christian body, you know? And so, yeah, as a Mormon, it would just be unheard of. So Mormon women generally marry very young, and the Mormon men generally marry, you know, pretty young after their missions, and their whole purpose is kind of to, to be homemakers and to bear children and, and, and that. So, so yeah. <laughs> as a missionary, yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, those are important things I think are, are important for people to understand. But the lifestyle as a missionary, and this is something that, you know, I, I always like to emphasize because, like, when we as Christians see the Mormon missionaries, like, my, the thing that I want to say to every person is please see them through the lens of love and compassion. It's a very challenging experience. The rules are extremely strict. I, they're somewhat different now. I went on a mission, you know, 18 years ago. They're a little bit uh, more relaxed now. But when I was a missionary, I mean, the only access you had to the internet was at a public library once a week when you were emailing your immediate family. You, you couldn't surf the internet. You could not read books that were not part of the approved list. You couldn't read magazines, newspapers. You couldn't go see movies, like no, no recreational things. Um, you, you obviously weren't 
working, you didn't have a job, you couldn't have a girlfriend, uh, and, and you had to go out, you know, for these 8, 10, 12 hours a day and, and be rejected by people and be yelled at by people and have, you know, I had glass bottles thrown at my head, I had people try to run me over with their cars, I had people swear at me, I had guns pulled on me and all these types of things, um, you know, where you're just daily being rejected by people and, and even Christians telling you you're in a cult and you're going to hell and get away from me, we're not interested in anything you have to say and, and, and you know, it was such a challenging experience and it is for a lot of young men and women. And so one thing that becomes very common um, amongst people who serve missions is depression, is homesickness, is people who, um, you know, you're away from your family, you're with a stranger, you're assigned this companion that you have to be with 24 hours a day. You don't get to choose this person. It's like being married they and not being able up. to choose your they, spouse. They tell you who. They pair you up with whoever they want. So the overseer of the mission does that, and, and, you, and you're assigned to this area, and this is what you got to do. You guys do. live together. You live together. In an apartment or whatever. Yeah, and, and, and and you have these expectations of how many people you have to talk to a day, and right, you have all these qualifications and 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 the, the, these worthiness standards that, that you have to uphold, and and you're missing your family, and you you just feel hopeless, and it's a very challenging experience. And so I say that only because so often we see the Mormon missionaries. Number one is like they're these like bulletproof robots that are just theologically trained, and it's like these are 18, 19, 20 year old kids who are away from their families, who are probably more scared of you than you are of them, <laughs> um, and, and who need love, they need compassion, they need gentleness, they, they need respect, and they need truth. And, and our response to them is, get off my doorstep, I don't want it. The, uh, and I, I hope you understood what he was saying when, about the ordinances, that those ordinances are often done for people who have already passed on. Uh, so that would be equivalent to me getting behind our baptistry and somebody coming down and handing me a card with a name of a past loved one, and they get baptized for that person. Okay? So do you see how... The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a works-based salvation. Plain and simple. If we had to boil it all down, it is a works-based salvation. Now, we can sit there and say, that is ludicrous. How can anybody be so naive to think that? that this is something they have been taught their entire life. They went to Sunday school just like you went to Sunday school and learned about those things. And so I just, I, I want us to be compassionate people who can have a organized, thoughtful conversation with somebody who we know does not believe like we believe that needs the truth. Um, this last video uh, is very helpful. In fact, I would encourage you, if you have your phone or something to write with or something to write on, he's going to give some very specific points on how to witness to a Mormon. If you have a conversation with a Mormon, there are some things that you should do. There are some things that you should not do. Uh, one of the things that he's going to say is uh, you trying to combat their religion on the basis of the the character flaws of Joseph Smith okay that that's not going to work uh, the, they they are just going to take that as almost a badge of honor that they are being persecuted for their faith okay so it's good to know these things about Mormonism but these things that you're about to hear are going to be very helpful in you actually carrying on a conversation with a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, Miss Jenny, let's watch that last video. Mike, a question from a lot of listeners is, you know, how do I evangelize a Mormon? How do I share the gospel and connect with a Mormon? You've made a list of steps or maybe a roadmap, if you will. I'm going to name each step and you unpack it. Ready? Number one, pray. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, with anything in the Christian life, it has to begin with prayer, right? A, a petition of the Lord, of aligning of our will with His, and, and having a belief in our hearts that God can change the people that, that we are seeking to evangelize and, and to immediately begin that process with prayer for that individual, that God will love them, that He will soften their heart, that He will open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Number two, you say, avoid contention. Yeah. Unpack that. So Mormons see contention as being of the devil. They see it as something that um, is immediately going to turn them off and become a barrier for them having any fruitful discussions in the future. And so I really encourage people to avoid contentious discussions or contentious topics they know are going to deliberately offend somebody, rather uh, to keep that focus and emphasis on the Word of God itself, and to do our best to, to remain loving and calm uh, and respectful and gentle in the manner in which we present truth. What a great application of when Paul says, I become all things to all men. Yeah. Someone might say, oh, i got to tell them the truth. Take it or leave it. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. You know, I'm yeah. just here. We should consider, I love that one, great, great, great suggestion. Number three, show genuine interest. Yeah. Well, I mean, the scripture says not only look to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Like we have to, we have to care for people. Um, our purpose in evangelizing is, is that we are interested in their salvation, that we love them enough to want to point them to truth that, that we uh, know can save them. And so we have to be interested in them and, and, and show that interest and show that love and, and let them know that, that we're genuinely invested into their lives. Shocking, the fruit of the Spirit, <laughs> which is your next one. Love them. Yeah. To me, this is the most important one. Only because love is the core of Christ, it is the core of the gospel, and it's the core of a believer. Right? As Jesus broke bread with his disciples and went out the night before he was going to give his life as an offering for the sins of mankind, he said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Um, love others, you know, and so that is the commandment that we have, to, to love one another and to be witnesses of the gospel, to speak the truth in love, and that if, if love is not at the core of our heart and the reason why we're sharing the gospel, we need to step back and evaluate the purpose. Are we trying to win an argument? Are we trying to prove somebody wrong? Are we trying to show them how much more we know about doctrine or theology than they do, or we do we genuinely pine for their salvation? Do we genuinely love them enough to want to tell them truth? So good. Another one, you say, let the word offend, not our actions. Mm. Yeah. Unpack that. Well, I, I think a lot of people, when they approach Mormons who have a lot of unique doctrines, right? Um, a lot of times what we want to do is focus on those unique doctrines, and, and what that does is it just deliberately offends them. Like, like we don't go to them lovingly, compassionately. We go to them kind of guns a-blazing about what's wrong and what's strange and what's bizarre about their belief system, and we actually miss an entire opportunity to be able to share truth with them. And so the Word of God itself is not going to have any shortcoming of offending other people and offending the non-believers. We know that the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so let God's Word offend. Let the gospel message offend. But let ourselves not be deliberately offensive through our words and our actions. Amen. Another one. Be gentle. and It's like all these are biblical and like Jesus, but they're really hard for the flesh when you want to get through to someone's mind and you think they're wrong and you're right. You say be gentle and respectful. Yeah. I mean, Paul said to correct our opponents with gentleness, right? Peter said Said, have, a, have a ready defense for that hope that lies within you, but do so with gentleness and respect. And so I think a lot of times we think that, oh, if I'm going to proclaim the gospel and I'm going to be this bold, unabashed witness of truth, that I can't do that gently and compassionately and respectfully. But you can. Like, they're not mutually exclusive. We can be bold in the gospel, but we can still lovingly and gently correct our opponents. We, do, we don't have to beat them over the head and bludgeon them over the head uh, with truth. We can gently deliver truth to them and then let the power of the Holy Spirit come convict their hearts. So good. Next one you say, see Latter-day Saints as victims, not enemies. Yeah. This, this was something that a good brother in Christ, a seasoned brother in Christ told me, and he said, you know, a lot of times when we, when we go out and we evangelize Mormons or any other people group, we kind of see them as the enemies. Like, in our objective is, like, I'm going to win a war, I'm going to win a battle, I'm going to win this argument. And he said, have you ever thought that instead of seeing them as enemies, see them as being held captive? They're hostages being held captive by the enemy, behind enemy lines, and how that changes your approach as to what they need. They need rescuing, they don't need destroying. 
And so for me, it, it really helped soften my heart because a lot of times, you know, we can get fired up and we can get passionate about things, not realizing that, like, that was me. Like, I was... I was dead, and, and, and I was gone, and I was an enemy, and I was uh, this hostage that God redeemed and saved and forgave when I didn't deserve that, and so God saw me through that love, and so that is how I want to see other people and to, to have that approach toward them. Another one. Focus on Mormon stress points. What do you mean by that? So a lot of Mormons are going to have different things that are going to be a burden on them. One of the biggest ones is like the uncertainty of forgiveness, right? The uncertainty of have I done enough? Am I good enough? Am I saved? Am I worthy? Those types of things are at least for me and for a lot of Mormons that I've dealt with throughout my life, they are stress points. They are things that they don't know about. And I think if you can focus on those things rather than trying to just focus on maybe obscure doctrines or character logical flaws of Joseph Smith or other things, but really focus on what they need, not what you want to tell them about what's wrong with Mormonism, but really focus on the things that they need to hear and, and the things that God can use to bring them to truth. Excellent. This one is a lot like Paul the Apostle's example. You say, speak the Mormon language. And so you're trying to reach the people kind of where they're at with their philosophical mindset and what they talk like. Unpack that. Mormon language, what is that? Yeah, so like Defining terms is important, but I, I think a lot of times we want to just express our theological prowess by using all these big words that, like, Mormons have no idea what that means. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you go to them and you start talking about propitiation and other things, they're going to kind of look at you strange. And so I think it's even just from a practical standpoint, like using terminology that they're familiar with and then defining that terminology as you use it so that you can make sure that the message of the gospel that you're trying to convey is clearly getting through to them. So maybe don't start with, you know, you're your soteriology is heretical <laughs> yeah, and your exactly. pneumatology is and they're going what are you I don't know what you're talking about exactly so good another one witness Christ rather than debate Mormonism yeah so so here's here's the thing that I've learned in many years of ministry and that's that there are a plethora of things that can draw people away from their faith in Mormonism but a person leaving Mormonism does not save them only Christ and only the gospel saves them. So when I was a Mormon missionary and a loving Baptist pastor proclaimed the gospel to me, he proclaimed the thing that he knew could redeem me, and that was the gospel and the gospel alone. It's the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. And so I think that a lot of times when we approach the Mormon people, we want to just emphasize those historical or archaeological or even certain doctrinal aspects about their faith, and we want to debate those. Mike, a question from a lot of listeners. And ask questions. The ministry of asking <laughs> questions, by the way, is a very unused ministry. Yeah. Use the Bible and ask questions. Yeah, I mean, so reemphasizing the power of the Word of God, right? Just understanding that the Bible has an inherent power, whether you believe in it or not, whether you think it's the Word of God or not. If you can use the Bible, then that Word of God is it's piercing people, right? God's Word, it goes forth, it doesn't return void, it accomplishes the thing that God has set forth for it to accomplish. And so because it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, there is power in the Word of God. And so we have to focus on the Word of God because it is the revelation of Christ through His Word that is going to bring people to salvation. And then asking questions, right? Jesus was like the ultimate example of that. I don't know how many uh, hundreds of questions He asked throughout His ministry in the New Testament. I think it was over 300. Yeah. And so... He set this example of when he was dealing with people, even hostile people, especially, he used questions in order to teach them. And so I think that's very important and kind of connecting that with the stress points, right? Asking those questions like, what do you believe that you need to do to be saved? Or do you know right now that you're forgiven? Or do you feel worthy? You know, things like that so that they can really evaluate things that are those stress points that are important to them so that you as a seasoned Christian and the Word of God can use the Word of God to address their very need and then to point them to Jesus Christ. So helpful. Thank you for putting those down on paper and for helping us understand how to better reach Mormons. Yeah, and just to say, God can save Mormons. And don't feel like it's a fruitless endeavor. And if you have a conversation with a Mormon and it doesn't go the way that you want it to go, that's okay. Right? Because God plants seeds and, and, and waters and, and then he gives the growth. And so we have to be there to be faithful witnesses of the gospel of Christ to Amen. the lost. Amen. Amen. As, as we close uh, tonight, 
Uh, would you take your Bible and turn to the New Testament to just one more verse? And as you turn to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Here's a verse I want us to remember even as we walk forward into talking about other world religions. The next world religion we're going to talk about is Catholicism. And uh, we're going to talk about how to point people to Jesus Christ. The reason I'm starting with these two, the, the, the Latter-day Saints and Catholicism, is because I think these are really the two that we might be most likely to encounter. And so we're going to take, we're going to take Catholicism next. And probably spend about three weeks on that. But as we move forward into all of these, I want us to keep this verse in mind right here. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The, 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 the Lord is even using this. I, I had somebody pull me aside Sunday morning right before Bible fellowships and say, uh, brought, brought me in the office and said, you're never going to believe what happened. And uh, they said, last Thursday, you're never going to guess who showed up at my door. And it was two Mormon missionaries. And uh, they were able to have a intelligent 30-minute conversation. And in that, they were able, a, even able to pull up some of the things that we've talked about on Wednesday night on their phone and allow these Mormon missionaries to hear some of the things. And at the end, the Mormon missionaries took a gospel track and uh, promised they would read it and consider it. And those, those Mormon missionaries may not have been converted, but I believe wholeheartedly a seed was planted in their theology and a little crack might have been formed there. And so uh, that's, that's the goal in all of this. It is not to win anything. Um, it, it is not to come away from something, acting, feeling like you have overcome in a conversation. We have to be harmless as doves. We have to have the spirit of Christ in all of these things and not be ashamed of the gospel. If, if, you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, uh, I, I believe that you should be able to at least tell how that happened. And always going back to the word of God because it is quick and powerful. But I don't, I don't want Lighthouse Baptist Church to be known as the mean-spirited Baptist church up on the hill. Um, you know, we, we've gotten calls from our hospital, okay, that called me and raked me over the coals because they found one of our gospel tracts in a Bible in the chapel that said get a real Bible because it wasn't the King James Version of the Bible. If I ever find out who it is, I will threaten church discipline on them because it ought not be named among us. Okay? Please, if you want to be contentious, please don't leave one of our gospel tracts. Okay, don't do that because that does more harm to the name of Christ than good. And so now I have a testimony to overcome down here because of that. I don't need those hurdles. Okay, I've got, I've got enough. I don't need those hurdles. So let's be salt and light. Remember, salt ought to make people thirsty. Okay, so let's be salt and light in this world as we go out. Be harmless as doves. Point people to Jesus Christ. Yes, they, they're, they're off base, absolutely, but they are the victims. We, victims, we've already heard it. And they need Jesus Christ just like you needed Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth that we've heard. I pray that we will use it. Lord, I pray that we will be equipped as we go out and proclaim you and proclaim the gospel and point people to you and Lord I pray that you will do the drawing I pray your spirit will work Lord that people will be born again as a result of the knowledge that we've gained over these past few weeks and we will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for it 
Lord, th thank you for this brother that came to a saving knowledge of you out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And now he is telling other people how to reach Mormons. God, help us to love people as you love them and see every soul as a soul for whom Christ died. We'll ask these things in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great night.